I was trying to figure out what we could use for a video, and I was looking at a lot of YouTube videos. I actually sent one of somebody redoing a kitchen, and you know, fast forward time lapse type deal. And I thought that would look really, really pretty cool, so I sent that to Saya, and then I said, or the fixer upper song from Frozen, so, <laughs> which is really what I wanted anyway. So, um, that works. Would you join me in a word of prayer and then we'll get going. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We're so grateful for the opportunity to come and take a look at your word. We ask that you would uh, just open our hearts and open our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, just a real briefly, this has nothing to do with my message, but I just have to say it anyway. Um, <clears throat> I came very close to doing, I told Saya this earlier. I was Saya's youth pastor, in case you didn't know that. Um, back when he was young and immature. Now he's older and immature. Um, but um, I almost pulled a dorky youth pastor thing today with speaking about Fixer Upper. I was going to wear my, you know, my, like stained up work pants and my work belt and a t-shirt and a hard hat. You know, really do the whole tooth, uh, the tool belt thing and everything. Go all, you know, Tim, Tim Taylor, uh, tool man. Uh, and then at, at the last minute yesterday afternoon, I decided we, I wasn't going to do that because it would just be too dorky, and Saya so said, thank you. Um, but I, I did want to get a different t-shirt, so my wife and I quick ran out to Kohl's, and we got this t-shirt, and I think I look beautiful in it. But um, <laughs> the whole point of this is I wanted to tell you what I found at Kohl's that I wanted to make an impulse buy that I would never use, but I wanted to own anyway. I'm looking at like a... Uh, like a, a discount rack and I see this like sweatshirt thing I was like what is that and then I see it's got legs and feet it's a pair of men's feety pajamas hood and everything but it's a Star Wars stormtrooper how cool would that be to own but what you what you need to understand it's made out of sweatshirt material I, in the middle of winter, I can't, I can't wear a shirt in the middle of winter to sleep, so there's just no way I could wear feety pajamas. But I wanted them so badly because how cool would it be to say, oh, I've got feety pajamas like Star, uh, Star Wars Stormtrooper. Anyway, like I said, had nothing to do with the message. I just needed to get that off my chest. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about being fixer upper and by the way Don I was also struggling with the verb form of fixer upper you know how do you get fixer upper <laughs> it's just I want to be fixer upper it's just kind of hard to hard to figure out how you do that but I wanted to take a look at today how we go about becoming one of God's fixer upper projects these fixer upper shows whether it's cars or homes or even bodies you always find people on those shows and you're like, man, how did they get on those shows? Like, I always want to be the guy who walks into Lowe's and somebody stops me in the parking lot and says, hey, we want to spend $80,000 in your backyard. Are you willing to have us come? Uh-huh. <laughs> Can we tear down your house? Uh-huh. You know? Um, that just sounds really exciting, but how do we get to be that? And how do we go about allowing God to do those things. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. First, I want to give you an example, briefly, from the Bible of a person, a believer, who needed fixing up bad. He got himself in a mess. King David and Bathsheba, you know, you probably know the story. I'm not going to go in-depth in it. It's found in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. If you want to take a look at that when you get home today, please don't read it while I'm speaking. It'll hurt my feelings. I can't see you anyway. But um, So... David, it starts out with, in the, uh, in the springtime of the year when kings go off to war, David, the rest of that sentence should say, went off to war with his armies, but it doesn't. It says he stayed home, sent Joab out with the army. And just real briefly, this is just extra. It's not even part of the message. This is for free. You're not even paying for this part. Sin always starts little. It never starts with great big decisions. It starts with little bad decisions and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the way, sin is what causes us needing to be fixed up in God's eyes. Sin. Our sin. All right? So, David starts out there. And then he's sleeping in. He gets up in the middle of the, in the, middle of the afternoon. He wakes up in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> he's a teenager. Um, 
he, not really, but he wakes up in the middle of the afternoon, goes up to the top of his castle, of his palace, and he's walking around, looking around, sees this woman on the top of her, of her house taking a bath. And he's very enamored, very taken with her, and uh, sends guys over. How secret was this? Sends guys over. They go, go, go get that girl. I want that. So they bring her up. He has sex with her, sends her back home, thinks, whew, that was fun. No, no. No, 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 no problem there. Everything's okay. Well, then he gets a message a little while later. Now, you've got to figure this is at least six weeks, right? Gets a message later from Bathsheba going, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. My husband's uh, you know, in your army off to war, so we have a problem. David goes to all sorts of different things. He brings Uriah, her husband, back and gets him drunk. Go home. Spend the night with your wife. Oh, I can't do that. Not while my men are out in the field. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> So he gets him drunk again. You know, Go home to your wife. No, I can't do that. So then he sends him home, but he sends him, he sends him, he sends him back to the army. I'm sorry, he sends him back to the battle. But he sends him back with, a, with, a, with a, a, probably a scroll that was sealed, no doubt, with the kingly seal. Couldn't be broken by anybody. It was a letter to the, the captain of the army. And he said to the, uh, to the captain of the army, uh, when you get into the fiercest part of the battle, I want you to put Uriah into that part of the battle. And once he's fully engaged, I want you to pull the rest of your men back back so that he is killed. I want him dead. So here goes Uriah with a sealed notice from the king to the commander. Here you go, sir. And so he opens it up. Who gave you this? Oh, the king did, sir. Okay. So he does it. Uriah gets killed. Okay, so everything's covered. But it's not covered. He gets caught. And uh, Nathan confronts him with a, with a real tender little story about, uh, about sheep and a, a lamb. And a guy had a whole bunch of sheep and a guy who had no sheep and just one little tiny little lamb that he slept with and loved him and everything. And, and David, of course, is just taken with this whole little lamb story because he was a shepherd. And he remembers how sweet little lambs were. And it's just this heart-wrenching story. And this guy loses his one and only little lamb. This, this rich man steals his lamb and kills it just to feed some friends. And it's just a terrible story. And David is livid. He says, who is the man? He's going to pay for that. And Nathan looks at him and says, you are. Because you had everything you wanted. You could have any woman you wanted, but you took another man's wife, and then you had him killed. And David confessed. So, David was a man in need of being fixed up. So what are the steps? What are the steps um, for becoming God's fixer-upper? What, what are the questions? And what we're going to look at is we're going to be homed in in 1 John 1, uh, verses 5 through 10 today. That's where we're going to just park for a while. We may mention some other things, but we're going to take a look at them. There are five ifs in John 5 through 10. Three of them are negatives. Two of them are positives. And these are the things that we need to do in order to get into where God can fix us up. God's willing to fix us up. By the way, David was forgiven. There were consequences for his sin, but he was forgiven. So, let's take a look at these verses, okay? First one, we have to cover this first. This is John 5, 10. This is, the, this is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, what we're using here is obviously a word picture for good and bad, sin and evil. Light is good, darkness is evil. Every culture in the world pretty much goes dark, bad, light, good. Remember the old westerns? Could always tell the bad guy. He's got a black hat, bad guy. White hat, good guy. Um, so every culture has that. Why is that? Obviously here at Action Church, we're not afraid of the dark because I can't see anybody. So, um, and apparently most of you guys have hair because I'm not even seeing any shiny heads right at the moment. So um, it's you know, darkness has always been associated with evil, and part of that, well, obviously the Bible uses it as a reference point, but also part of it is darkness <laughs> you can't see. So there could be scary stuff. I think I told you before. I grew up in a very dangerous situation. My brother was actually, that I shared a bedroom with, my brother was actually a werewolf. Um, <laughs> don't you laugh. He was. My dad didn't believe me either. Um, I'll save my whole fear of the dark for another message sometime. 
But so we have this picture, and what, what this is saying is that God is pure, perfect, pure light, and anything apart from that perfect, pure light is evil. And no darkness dwells in him. No evil, no sin dwells in God. So that's an important thing. It's a great place to start because that's what he's saying is God is perfect light. We aren't. Mankind is not. And that's what the Bible tells us. So first off, we're going to take, it the three, we're going to take a look at the three negative ifs in 1 John. And it's really, it's really interesting as he wrote this, um, it comes off as he goes negative, positive, negative, positive. But we're going to go with all three negatives to start with. Okay? So the very first one that we're going to take a look at is, if we, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. What's happening here? When it says if we walk if we claim to have fellowship and yet walk in the darkness, if our lifestyle, if, if what we demonstrate by our lives, where we walk, not the specific places, but the attitudes, and sometimes it is the places, obviously if you're walking into a strip club, eh, could be a problem. Um, so, but it's the whole idea of our lifestyle. Does our lifestyle say, yep, that's a person who has a, rel who has a relationship with God, or does it not? If our lifestyle is saying one thing and our words are saying another, what is that called? Out loud. A hypocrite. Right? You're being a hypocrite. You're saying one thing, you're living another thing. So we have to make sure that we are living a life that demonstrates or that is, that is in agreement with our words. And if they aren't, then our words are wrong. Our lifestyle is what we are. Our words are wrong. And, it's, and it says that we lie and don't live out the truth. If, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you are living a certain way, and by the way, it's important that as I talk about this, and as we talked about David, there wasn't a loss of salvation. There's a loss of relationship and a loss of blessing, but never a loss of salvation. You don't lose your salvation. That's done for. But let me just add to that, every time you talk about that, somebody will say, so there's nothing I can do. I can do anything I want to do. I can sin as much as I want, and I still get to go to heaven if I'm saved. Well, there's a problem with that. And I think most of you can probably see it. If I'm saved, if Christ has made me into a new creature, which is what the Bible says happens when we get saved, I don't want to sin. Do I still sin? Yes. Does it happen? Do I fall into sin? Could I fall into grievous sin? Yes. But I don't want to. So when someone says to me, well, then I can sin all I want. If you want to sin, I would take a serious look at your salvation. Okay? Now, I didn't say I want to take a serious look at your salvation. I want you to take a serious look at your salvation if that's the way you can live. So just be careful with that. If we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and don't do the truth. So that's the first negative. The second negative is um, if, we, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So when it says if we, if we claim to be without sin, now that's talking about the whole, well, there's no such real thing as sin. There's no real thing like sin. I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. I was at a party one time, not long after I got saved, probably about two years after I got saved, and um, I was in a, uh, in a musical with, uh, there was a, a Catholic girl's school in the city that I lived in, and they needed guys, obviously, to play parts in their musical because it was a girl's school. And we were doing Bye Bye Birdie, and I had the part of Conrad Birdie, which is basically a Elvis Presley-type person. But anyway, I went to the cast party, and of course these kids were all drinking and stuff like that, and one, my one Christian friend and I went there, and we were trying to be good Christians and witness to these kids, and um, I was talking with this one girl, and I said, well, God is just as real as this chair. There was a padded chair right next to me. We were sitting on the floor. And I said, God is just as real as this chair sitting right here. And she goes, how do you know that chair is real? because I'm touching it, and it's right there, and I can sit in it. How do you know any of this is real? We may be living part of someone else's ideas. Okay. 
I think we're done talking. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you do with that? But if, the, the idea here is if we claim to be without sin, that there is no sin. There's no such thing as sin. That's the world we live in, folks. There's, no, there's nothing wrong. Just be careful where you do it. As long as you're not offending anyone else. Okay, here's the problem with that. That's what the world says. It's not what God says. Our worldview is so important. If you're a Christian, your worldview should come out of this. That's where it should come. And this, bi this book, the Bible, says that, man, that says that there is sin and that man is sinful. You know, when you look at the way the world looks today, like I just was listening to politicians talking through this week of just horrible violence all the way around, and I hear people saying how they believe in the goodness of mankind. How can you see what's going on out here and say, sorry, how can we look at what's going on out there and then say man is basically good? Man's not basically good. The Bible's real clear on that. Man's not basically good. Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 17, 9 says that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Each man, every single man, human being, is wicked on the inside. We have to, if we start at a starting point there, then we realize there's something that has to be fixed. See, this whole fixer-upper message doesn't work if all mankind is basically good. Well, you just have to try a little harder. Everything will be good. It doesn't work that way. It, it never has. So, if we claim to be without sin, there is no such thing. Now, the next one kind of seems like the same thing, but it's really not. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Now, this is where I think you and I are probably going to get, like, you know, smacked in the head by God. Because God's going, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're doing a great job, Dave. You haven't denied that there's even the concept of sin. But, Dave, I really need to talk with you about some of the stuff you're doing because I really think you're just kind of sugarcoating a lot of your life. I think you're missing. You're not paying attention to what sins are actually taking place in your life. This is where we're saying, well, I haven't sinned. Or, even more popular, well, now... Now, I may have sinned, but I'm not as bad as Don Record. I'm not as bad as Josiah Katz. You know, we, there's always somebody else we can point to that's worse. And by the way, I've got both of them beat in the sin arena, hands down. And that's not a good thing. They're both great people. Um, but I should have used somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler. That always works. Um, but, you know, if we claim that we have no sin, or that we have not sinned, what does it say? Is that we make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. If God's word is in us, it convicts us of sin. Now, we may do it again and again and again until we figure out how to stop doing it, but it should continue to run into that word of God and just get confronted, and we have to take care of it. So those are the negatives. Those are the things that cause us to need to be fixed up. It's funny because I can see a monitor back there, and I can see if I get my hand up here too high. It covers like every bit of me, but it's really cool to see. Anyway, um, and anybody who thinks I have ADHD, you're just crazy, but I do need my meds. Um, so... We're going to talk now about the positives. We talked about those three negatives, about walking in a way that says we're not a believer, or walking in a way that doesn't say we're a believer, um, denying the whole concept of sin, or denying our individual sins. Now let's talk about what we can do about those sins. How does the actual fixing up take place? Those fixer-upper shows I love, because it's like... Yep, well, what we're going to do here, you know, as we were, as we were taking apart the kitchen, we realized that the floorboard, that the, that the joists underneath the floor were all termite-eaten. So we had to take that out. And as we did that, we realized that the basement floor needed new concrete. And when we did that, we realized, it's like, okay, that would be so cool. Can I have your credit card? Because <laughs> I want to work with your credit card. You know, I try to do stuff like on a shoestring when I try to fix stuff at the house. I'll give you one fixer-upper story that my daughter very kindly reminded me of by sending me a clip on Facebook yesterday. A little bit too late to get up here, but anyway. One day I was putting up a ceiling fan with a light fixture underneath it. I've done that before, and it's always worked. So a couple of my kids are there watching, and 
I'm busy putting this up, and I'm sure they were all so impressed with how handy their dad is. <laughs> you know, I can put this thing up. You know, I'm getting it all done, get it all wired up and everything. Well, then there's only one, only one thing left to do. Now, bear, bear in mind, this is a ceiling fan with a light fixture, four lights underneath it. When you flip the switch on, what is supposed to happen? The lights are supposed to come on, and the fan is supposed to spin, right? Easy enough. Spinning did take place. I want you to know that. It did. The problem was it was the lights that started spinning and not the fan. <laughs> the good news is someone else did it too because my daughter just found a YouTube video of it. So apparently there are other people who are as talented as I am at fixering, uppering, or fixing up, or whatever it's called. So, let's get to the positives. The positives. This is how we go about fixing the problem. The first verse that I want you to see is verse small. Seven, thank you. You would not believe how small that is over here. Really, it's just unbelievable. Okay, so anyway. If we walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, obviously, this is following that if we walk in a way that's, that doesn't demonstrate. This is saying if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We're all going to get along. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So our lifestyle is part of it. Clean up the way you walk. Clean up the way you walk. Are there things in your life that are holding you back? Are there sins in your life that you're, that you're holding on to? Are there habits in your life that you're holding on to? Let go of them if they're keeping you from getting closer to God and closer to each other, other believers. You gotta let go of those things, you know? You got to, there's a story, it's, it's an anecdote at this point. Whether it actually ever happened or not, I don't know. But it's a great story of like a 1930s uh, beat cop in New York City gets called over to a, to a candy vending machine. And as he gets there, there's a crowd. And he parts the crowd getting in there. And he gets up there and there's a seven-year-old kid, boy, with his hand up inside the candy machine where he was trying to steal a candy bar. And there, everyone is saying, oh, officer, officer, this poor little boy, his, arm, his hand is stuck. He can't get it out. He can't get it out. He says, son, here, let me, he tries pulling on his hand, pulling, and sure enough, his hand is stuck. And he was, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to have to dismantle the whole machine. But this cop looks at the kid and says, son, let go of the candy bar. And the hand comes out. It's an illustration of what we held on to. You know, you got to let go of those things. You've got to let go of those things. You can't continue to live your life walking in a way that's not good. So this says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So there we go. Now we're getting to the actual dealing with sin. The blood of Jesus purifies us from that sin. How do we go about doing that? Conveniently enough, the next verse deals with that. If we confess our sins, he says, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let's make sure we understand who is he in that verse. If we confess our sins, he, who's he? Out loud. God, thank you. It's important that we understand that. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now how does that work? How exactly does that work? Let me give you a little illustration. I'm going to use a whiteboard because, because I'm so technologically advanced. Okay, now I've got to make sure I talk into the microphone. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's going to get on the camera or not. Okay, so let's say this is Dave Carrison's life. I wake up in the morning and I'm rude to my wife, so that's a sin. Oh, wow, look at this. I have a minion. <laughs> oh gosh, I want to be so mean. There's another sin right there. Um, okay, so as I as I go through as I go through my day, I find myself come over here a little closer. There we go. As I as I go through my day, I find myself doing, you know, a, a sin here, a sin there, a sin there, sin, 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 sin. I woke up at six thirty. It's now six uh, six thirty-five. Um, 
So I go through my day, and I've got all this sin, all these things that I've done wrong. What is sin? Okay, thank you, Sai. I'll take care of that now. You good? Yep, I'm good, because there's only one other thing I need to do with it, and it's simple. Maybe. So I go through my day, and I have blown it in certain areas. I've lived in a way that I shouldn't live. I've done some things. What is sin? sin? There are sins of commission, things I did wrong that I shouldn't have done wrong. There are sins of omission, things that I should have done, th- but I didn't do. Hebrews even says anything that's done not of faith is sin. How are we going to know if our lifestyle is sinful or not? Well, there's one key way to do it. Spend time in this word, in this book. That's how you find out what's right, what's wrong. That's, and by the way, pretty much the only way. Now, you can listen to, listen to sermons that are on these things. You can listen to podcasts that are on these things. Those are all great, and they'll help you too because they're taking the Word and bringing it to you. But this is where we find out what is sin. It's in the Bible, all right? So I go through my day. I've got all these sins. I've got all this dirt, and I'm supposed to confess them because that's what this verse says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Okay, so I go to confess the sins. So as I confess them, this is not really a good, illust- a perfect illustration, but as I confess them, let me just show you a little bit of what happens. An angel, as I confess, is doing this. Okay, so I confess this one. Good. And this one. And this one, oh, you know what? Dave confessed all of those. So as I go through and start confessing, I cover all of them. But you know what? There are things I don't remember. There are things I, don't, I, I can't remember. So what happens to those? God sits up in heaven going, huh, didn't confess it and ain't forgiven. You're still on the hook, pal. Take a look at that verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, God is willing to take, God is willing to take all of that away. All that crud he's willing to take away. And he makes something new. See, I used to, I, I, I used to watch those fixer up. Like I, I like to watch Count's Custom Cars. I don't know if any of you have seen that, where he goes to like a junkyard and finds a, you know, a 57 T-Bird that's all rusted out. We're going to make this baby beautiful. Give it new life. No, you're going to build a new car that looks kind of like that frame. It gets a new engine. It gets a new tranny. It gets new upholstery. It gets new body parts. It gets new everything. But here's the deal. It still looks like that old one, doesn't it? That's what happens when God invades a life for the first time. God comes in and totally redoes everything inside. So the the this thing that we see outside, this body suit is something that I heard a a a preacher refer to this as. This body suit stays looking the same, but everything inside changes because God changes it. The Bible says that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have become new. We have been totally fixed up if we are believers, if that is true about us, that we are believers. My question for you today is, where are you in this? Where are you in this? Are you still a 57 T-bird sitting in the junkyard? You haven't been fixed up at all? You haven't had God totally redo you inside? Are you a believer who's been redone inside, but you've fallen into into sin? You're walking in a way you shouldn't be, or you're 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 harboring sins that you that you know you shouldn't be? Or are you one of the ones that God has that you're constantly being fixed up inside? And that's the thing, is that that previous verse, you know, it says about being purified. It's an ongoing thing. God continues. We confess. God continues to forgive. How many times can you go to God with the same sin? Peter asked Jesus this question. Or Jesus asked Peter, actually. How many times do you... No, Peter said, how many times do I need to forgive him? And then Peter offers seven times? Because he thought he was being really generous. You know, if I forgive that guy for the same thing seven times, ha, I am quite the dude. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. 
Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you keep counting when you get to 490, you're done. Okay? Seven times 70, 490? Yeah. I can't multiply sevens. I don't know why, but I really can't. Um, so, 490 times. No, it's just there's never a time where God says, no, I've forgiven you enough as many times as I can. We have constant line of forgiveness, but the way we get it is individually for ourselves. We individually step up and say, God, fix me up. If you're one of those here today who's never, you're still the 57 T-birds sitting in the junkyard, you can get on to God's fixer-upper show, and he'll do it, no matter what. No matter what. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the nation's worst serial killers ever. And he got saved before he was murdered in prison. People say, wait a minute. Wait, wait. No, 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 no. Dude ate people. Come on. No, he did not get saved. Isn't that just convenient? God couldn't possibly forgive him. God did forgive him. When we get to heaven, far as we can tell by his testimony and by the life he lived afterwards, short, he was a believer. Here's the problem. If God can't forgive Jeffrey Dahmer for his sins, he can't forgive you and me. And I really want to be forgiven. So God can forgive anything, no matter what you've done, no matter how far away you've walked, if you've never gotten saved, or if you're a believer and you've walked away and you're acting in a way you shouldn't be. No matter what, God is always willing to take you back. God stands there waiting. There's the story of the prodigal son. I'll close with this. The band wants to come up. There's a story of the prodigal son. This boy, he has, man, he has two sons. One son says, I'm done with this. Don't want to be part of dad's family. You know, I, just want to I want to have my money. I want to go party, have a good time. He does. He gets his money from his dad, goes out, parties, runs out of money, and then he's living there eating, eating pig food or wanting to eat pig food. That's a Jew wanting to eat pig food. That's a horrendous picture. And then one day the lights come on and he says, wait a minute. There are people, there are servants at my father's house that are treated better than this. I'm going to go back and ask to be one of his servants. I'm no longer good enough to be considered a son. And so he starts making his way home. And, while, and the Bible says while he is still a long way off, his father saw him. How did his father see him? He was watching for him. He, I, I, would, I like to believe he was standing in the same place where, he's, where he said goodbye to his son. And so off the son goes, lives like hell, comes back a beaten, broken, busted up man. And while he's a long way off, the father saw him and the father ran to him. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of the way God wants to forgive us. But we have to deal with the sin. We confess it. The son said, I am no longer worthy to be your son. Let me be your servant here. Forgive me. Let me be your servant here. And the father says, stupid stuff. Hugs him, puts a robe on him, gets him shoes, gets him a gold ring, has a great big party. This is wonderful. My son is home. And that's what God wants to do for us. Now notice that's a son, that's a believer, if you want to push that story as far as it can go. Okay, so folks, get fixed up. Don't keep living like a 57 Chevy busted up. Don't keep li living like a, like a house that's fallen apart. Let God fix you up. But you have to spend time in His Word and you have to spend time with him in prayer. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We ask that you would work in our hearts and help us to understand that where we are today is a reflection of just how we've allowed you and your word to work in our hearts. I pray that you would just convict each one of us <clears throat> in the areas that we need convicting. I pray that if there's someone here today who's never, um, never stepped into the Christian arena, 
that they would have their heart pulled into a relationship with you. I pray that if there are people here today who are living a life that doesn't represent the Christian testimony that they claim, that you would work in their lives as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.